In this reflection, I'd like to return to Robert Wright's book, The Moral Animal, and look specifically at chapters 8 and 9 of that book. Uh, let's see what Wright has to say. Wright tells us that Darwin believed that the world's varied moral customs um, were rooted, at least in a general sense, in a common human nature. He suggested that the word moral itself um, be reserved for our own species, but still Darwin saw a social instinct that predated humanity, even if human evolution enriched it. Wright suggests that in figuring out how evolution favored moral impulses, it's critical to focus on behaviors that they bring, because it is behavior, not thought or emotion, that natural selection actually passes judgment on. Acts, not feelings themselves, directly guide the transportation of genes. Wright reminds us that behavioral habits are passed from parent to child by instruction or example, not via the genes. No life experiences except, say, exposure to radiation affect the genes handed down to offspring. The very beauty of Darwin's theory of natural selection in its strict form was that it didn't require the inheritance of acquired traits as had previous evolutionary theories, for example, that of Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck. Wright tells us that in 1966, George Williams suggested a way to make Darwin's musings about the evolutionary value of mutual assistance more useful by removing any conscious motives. Williams reasoned that it is necessary that help provided to others be occasionally reciprocated if it is to be favored by natural selection, and that it is not necessary that either the giver or the receiver be consciously aware of this. Wright tells us that William's basic point here is one that we've encountered earlier, that is that animals, including people, often execute evolutionary logic not via conscious calculation, but by following their feelings, which were designed to be logic executors. William's terse speculations, says Wright, were transformed into a full-fledged theory by Robert Trivers in 1971 in a paper titled The Evolution of Reciprocal Altruism, which was published in the Quarterly Review of Biology. Wright tells us that uh, we may be wrong to assume that people pursue pleasure or happiness or utility with unwavering rationality. An evolutionary psychologist would tell us that humans are not rational, calculating machines. They are animals guided by conscious reason, but also by various other forces. Long-term happiness, however appealing we may find it, is not what we're designed to maximize in any evolutionary sort of sense. Wright explains that although we are not calculating machines, humans were designed by a calculating machine, a highly rational and coolly detached process, and that the machine designed us to maximize a single currency, that is, total genetic proliferation or inclusive fitness. He reminds us that, of course, the designs don't always work. Individual organisms often fail, and for various reasons, to transmit their genes, some are bound to fail. That is the reason evolution works so assuredly well. But it is important to remember that in the case of human beings, the design work of natural selection was done in a social environment quite different from our current environment today. Friendship, affection, and trust were the things that held human societies together long before there were social contracts or prescribed laws. Long before our ancestors were reciprocal altruists, they were capable of familial affection and generosity, of trust and guilt in a kinship sense. William Hamilton and Robert Axelrod in their 1984 book, The Evolution of Cooperation, suggest that kin selection probably paved the way for reciprocal altruism. And Wright tells us that reciprocal altruism has presumably shaped the texture not just of human emotion, but uh, human cognition as well. 
Of interest here is the notion that reciprocal altruism may account for the very core of a human sense of justice, that is, justice may be a byproduct of human evolution, a consequence of a simple tit-for-tat genetic stratagem. Actually, Wright says reciprocal altruism in the classic one-on-one -on -one sense can by itself yield seemingly collectivist behavior. In a species with language such as ours, one effective and almost effortless way to reward nice people and punish mean people is to affect their reputations accordingly. Spreading the word that someone cheated you is a potent retaliation since it leads people to withhold altruism from that person for fear of getting burned. People spend lots of time sharing grievances, listening to grievances, deciding whether grievances are just, and amending their attitudes toward the accused accordingly. The airing of grievances can lead to widespread reactions that function as collective sanctions, and Wright reminds us that this has come to be a vital part of all moral systems. Wright tells us that a common reaction to Robert Trivers' theory of reciprocal altruism is discomfort. Some people are troubled by the idea that their noblest intentions or impulses spring from the gene's wiliest ploys. But the more one ponders reciprocal altruism's finer points, the more mercenary genes become. Wright notes that perhaps the most legitimately dispiriting thing about reciprocal altruism is that it is a misnomer. Whereas with kid selection, the goal of our genes is to actually help another organism. With reciprocal altruism, the goal is that the organism is left with the impression of being helped. And uh, that impression is enough for reciprocation. But when it doesn't, when we look nice, without really being so nice, or when we can profitably be mean without getting caught. Don't be surprised, says Wright, if an ugly part of human nature surfaces. Robert Wright is clearly persuaded that George Williams' 1966 musings about reciprocal aid into a compelling body of explanation is one of the greatest feats of the 20th century. It involved ingenious and distinctly modern tools of analysis and brought monumentous results. Though the theory of uh, reciprocal altruism isn't proved in the sense that theories of physics can be proved, it rightly commands much confidence within biology, and Wright tells us that confidence should grow as the connection of genes to the human brain becomes clearer in the coming decades. He adds, though the theory isn't as arcane or as mind-bending as the theories of relativity or of quantum mechanics in the end, it may alter the world view of the human species more deeply and more problematically.